This podcast includes information provided by the issuer and does not express the views of the interviewer. This podcast may also include forward-looking statements by the issuer that involve certain risks and uncertainties to its business. Because forward-looking statements are subject to risks and uncertainties, the issuer's actual results could differ from those indicated in this podcast. Welcome to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and thank you all so much for the support and for tuning in. You can follow Planet Microcap on Twitter at Bobby K. Kraft. That's B-O-B-B-Y-K-K-R-A-F-T. And you are listening to episode 48. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to tweet at me or shoot me an email at rcraft at snnwire.com. And when you do get a chance, if you'd like what you hear, please rate and review Planet Microcap on iTunes. It really helps provide feedback for me and spread the microcap message. For this episode of the Planet Microcap podcast, I spoke with Ralph Garcia from Echelon Wealth Partners. Ralph was a participant on the Institutional Investors Panel at the Planet Microcap Showcase, which is available on stocknewsnow.com's YouTube channel. After that panel, I had the pleasure of speaking to Ralph a bit more, and I thought he would be a great guest to have to describe his experiences as a professional analyst. You know, we've spoken to a lot of individual investors on the podcast discussing their strategies, and I was curious if there was a fundamental difference between them and professional analysts. The goal for this episode is to learn more about how a professional analyst goes about doing their due diligence and research on a microcap company. Thank you again for tuning into episode 48 of the Planet Microcap podcast. Please enjoy my interview with Ralph Garcia, but first, A word from our sponsor. A comprehensive streaming of market data, research, and portfolio management application for you. QuoteStream is a real-time streaming quotes and research system designed for the day trader, retail investor, institutional investor, both new and old. QuoteStream offers low latency, tick-by-tick data, advanced charting, comprehensive technical analysis, news, and research. With no software to install and no servers to maintain, QuoteStream is the ideal solution for you. Go to stocknewsnow.com and start your free seven-day trial. Click the QuoteStream banner in the header or real-time quotes in the nav bar to get started building and managing your investments. For this episode of the Planet Microcap podcast, I have Ralph Garcia on the program. He is the Managing Director, Technology, and Diversified Industries Analyst at Echelon Wealth Partners. Ralph, welcome to the Planet Microcap podcast. Bobby, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to doing the podcast. It's great to have you on, and uh, again, thank you for uh, for joining us, and and I welcome you. Um, so, uh, as as we do on the podcast, um, our first question uh, is, what is your background? Well, uh, I'm an aerospace engineer by training, and uh, did about five years working in the field uh, for the Havilland slash Bombardier, uh, working on the design side. Um, mainly minimizing noise and vibration in the Dash 8 400Q uh, aircraft. Um, after that, I moved to Michigan uh, for about three years, selling the, the software I was using at, at Bombardier. Uh, it was a Belgian company. They, they were looking to grow their business in, uh, in the U.S., so I moved to uh, Rochester Hills, Michigan, and uh, basically grew their business uh, you know, in the automotive sector through the Tier 1 and 2 suppliers. Uh, and that's really where I got my feet wet uh, on the s- selling the software side of the business. Uh, finished my MBA before I moved down to uh, to Michigan, and you know after three years, uh, uh, we thought we were going to go public. Uh, uh, on the back of the Netscape IPO, the uh, the Belgian owners decided to stay private, and um, you know, that gave me the opportunity to, to reevaluate things and, and and come back to Canada. Uh, you know, into the financial sector as an analyst. Interesting. So aerospace engineer, how, were, were you always interested in, in aerospace as a kid? I mean, how did you get into that? Yeah, it was, uh, it was interesting. Uh, I was one of the pioneers in a, in a program here that the uh, public school uh, board was putting on at the high school level. I was, uh, you know, they started recruiting kids in grades seven and eight, uh, uh, so I was one of the first into uh, this five-year program uh, at Central Technical High School in Toronto. I'll plug my high school. 
so we had five years of aerospace. We built our own Cessna 150. We had a link simulator. I mean, it was an unbelievable program at the high school level. And then, you know, I just followed that into the University of Toronto, uh, the engin- engineering science program there, one of the toughest, you know, university programs, I would say, in the world. Um, and just continued that for four years. Uh, they had a co-op program with uh, with the Havlin Bombardier. And, uh, you know, if I hadn't done my MBA, I'd probably still be uh, working at Bombardier, I think. Uh, the MBA sort of opened up a whole bunch of new opportunities for me in software and, and tech. But, uh, but, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, the passion started from, you know, when I was uh, 10, 11 years old. And... Yeah, I continued right through right through university. That's such a cool program. Huh. So, man, I, that's awesome. I mean, did you uh, did you end up also then uh, wanting to get your pilot's license? I mean, you know you know how it works. I'm sure you wanted to fly the thing. Yeah, no, we uh, I started that uh, when I was at the Havlin and, and continued that uh, when I moved to Michigan. It got a bit more expensive when I moved because uh, it wasn't being subsidized by my employer. Uh, but I had my 40 hours uh, ground training, uh, most of the simulator stuff I had done uh, uh, when I was in high school. Uh, we had flown the Cessna 150 that we built, if you can believe that. Uh, yeah, so I was flying the 150 when I was 16 years old. Uh, but unfortunately, again, when I, when I moved to Michigan, I just uh, uh, had to put my automotive hat on and, and modeling cars and um, did not pursue it uh, uh, after that, and uh, n- you know, never did get that pilot's license. Well, there's still time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so okay, so so you 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 make the jump to to become an analyst. You know, what was the impetus behind that? And was there anything that your employer who hired you required of you, or was it simply that you know you had this engineering background, so they thought, oh, okay, he'll industrials, technology, Ralph, you got it, you know, was, was it like that? Um, it was a mixture of, of that and, and the three years sort of building that software business uh, for the Belgians. I mean, we took it from zero to just north of 15 million in revenue selling, you know, noise and vibration software to uh, automotive, aerospace and, and other sectors. That definitely did help. Uh, I think the main catalyst was the Netscape IPO. I mean, that came out... Uh, August 1995, um, uh, yeah, the street up here in, in Canada was, you know, the tech coverage was looking to to split the coverage between hardware and software analysts. Um, uh, you know, I had a couple of friends who were working for Scotia at the time, Scotia Bank, and uh, he called me up, asked if I wanted to come back to Canada and said, you know, that'd be a great opportunity. I'd love to be an analyst. Uh, so I think between the Netscape IPO and, and you know the street up here splitting the tech coverage, you know hardware and software that that, that really created the opportunity for me. Mm-hmm. Did you have any like formal training or, or were you interested in in the stock market even before that? Or when you when they hired you, did they kind of say, all right, time to take the crash course. Here's how it all works. No, I definitely uh, had been investing uh, when I had moved, uh, even before I moved down. I mean, I was investing when I was at De Havilland. And uh, uh, so from the finance side and the MBA side, I was, was quite familiar with the investment side of the business. I uh, got the practical experience, you know, down in Michigan, uh, you know, building a business, working with, uh, uh, you know, a, uh, a foreign owner and back and forth to Belgium once a quarter and, uh, you know, it was quite the experience, and um, I think that provided sort of the, the, the fundamental uh, building blocks to, to become an analyst. Mm-hmm. And, and when was it during this time as well that you got your start investing in microcap stocks too? It was uh, yeah, no, it was really more when I was when I came back because when I was investing, it, it, you know, I was looking more at larger caps and more of the larger cap tech names, but. Uh, um, I, th- I think when I came back uh, to Scotia, we were trying to build a business where, you know, we'll finance the, the smaller cap, micro cap names. Uh, you, you cover the large caps, uh, you know, to get in front of customers and, and sort of build that side of the business. Uh, but, it, you know, I didn't really start digging into the micro caps uh, until I had come back to uh, to Canada. Mm-hmm. So, and you've been now, so you've been, so you went back in 
96. Eight. Been doing it for 20 plus years now. <laughs> so, uh, so what is what is your day to day life like as an analyst? You know, tell me what. How has it changed even in in the last 20 years? Uh, that's a, a very good question. You <laughs> used to have two to three days before you got a Q and a K to analyze stuff. Now, now you got to make calls in real time. If if, you know, if a news item or a pre announcement comes out on a quarter, um, so yeah, much more stressful now. Um, <laughs> I'm sure, you love and, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, you know, micro cap, micro cap tech. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. I mean, you know, this is where all the innovation is. You get to meet some of the brightest, uh, you know, people you, you, you're ever going to meet in your life, uh, you know, much brighter than myself. And hopefully you can find the capital to, you know, help these guys grow. And, and then you grow with them, you know, whether they need capital to do acquisitions or at some point they need advisory help on the M and a side. Um, and I've seen that throughout the 20 years where, uh, you know, we've helped companies through an IPO and then we were involved in the M&A advisory uh, on their exit. Mm -hmm. So then, so um, I should have asked this in separately, but I'm going to, I'm going to re-ask the, the first part of that question again. So what, what is the, the day-to-day -day life like for you as, as an analyst? I mean, you're, you're constantly meeting uh, companies. So you'll probably see, you know, we'll probably see two or three companies a day. Um, private uh, public companies that you know are coming through town and you know want to meet with you to give you an update on their story um, you're calling your respective uh, company base that you've got coverage on I mean I cover 18 companies now I've got another 20 or so on a watch list so you're, you're constantly making phone calls throughout that that company list uh, you know, getting updates if a press release has come out and you want more color on uh, on the news. Um, so a lot of phone time, uh, you know, a lot of FaceTime with, with companies that are coming through town and then um, a lot of marketing time with uh, pension funds, hedge funds and investors. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I'm usually in the office by 6.30 a.m. and I'm lucky if I get out before 6 p.m. Wow. Uh, and then you're, yeah, you know, you're on the phone driving home. You're, yeah. You know, um, so you're you're constantly uh, in in discussions again, either with the companies you cover, prospective companies you want to cover, uh, or investors. So what what are some of the things that you look for? You know, what what does your your strategy uh, consist of when you're analyzing a new uh, microcap tech name? I mean, the, fir the first thing we look at is is really the management team. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, the first, the first thing. Yeah, I mean, before you want to waste any time on, on digging even deeper, right? I mean, have these guys done it before? What's sort of their background? Well, do you, uh, well, do you screen do you screen them out first and then talk to management, or or is it you just go right into talking to management first and then you and then you go you work backwards? Yeah, normally I'll do that. I'll just either go to their website to do a quick background check on, uh, you know, on their pedigree and do they have a history of, of sort of growing companies. I mean, if it's a startup, uh, you sort of give them a bit more leeway. Um, uh, you know, if it's a younger management team, and then, it, you know, in both cases, after you sort of get through that first uh, that first hurdle, then you just look at sort of the market opportunity. Uh, you know, hopefully it's a multi-billion-dollar market opportunity, and these guys can sort of find their way into into growing this business, right, to fifty, hundred million in revenue or so over time. But um, uh, yeah, you know, you're betting on the management team. It's uh, yeah. Uh, once you've done the industry analysis and, and the company analysis on the product, whether it's software, hardware, etc., um, you're going to be betting on these uh, on the horses, so to speak, and whether they're going to be able to. Uh, uh, to execute on that opportunity, right? So when it, so when you're assessing management, you know what are some of the the uh, the patterns you've seen amongst the more successful teams that that you've seen? I think the most important thing, especially for microcaps, is if if they've got experience doing mergers and acquisitions and, and integrating companies. Mm. Um, you know, a lot a lot of these guys uh, again are some of the the best of the best of the brightest and. Um, yeah, if 
if they're not going to be able to grow organically, uh, either the market's too early, which, you know, sometimes that happens. You got a great product, but the market's not ready for you. Um, if these guys can sort of pivot and, and do some acquisitions to sort of backfill and gain scale while the market evolves to, to meet their product. Um, you know, have they done this before and you know, can, can, can they do the integration side of, of an acquisition? That's where a lot of companies stumble. Mm-hmm. And then when from there, you know, after, after you've done your, your kind of background on them and you see like, okay, they've had a little M&A background. Okay, they've been in this industry for a long time. You know, like what when you meet with them in person or that first phone call, you know, what are some indicators to you there? I mean, normally you'll uh, you'll get a feel as they go through the presentation on um, uh, you know their ability to take this product and this great idea they've come up with to uh, to growing the market and, and, and selling that product. So if if they can easily talk about growing a channel and building a sales force as they can about you know the love of their product, then you start feeling comfortable that you know the management team has the ability to, to, to grow this. Sometimes, you know, the entrepreneur can't get out of that uh, that that mindset of just doing R and D for the sake of doing R and D, and then they forget about you know how the hell do they sell this product, right? And uh, inevitably, if if you get that sort of management team, um, you know, those guys are run out of balance sheet at some point, can't raise funds. Um, and eventually they'll get sold or acquired. So, uh, you know, you want a CEO who's, who's equally as, as as comfortable talking about building a sales channel as they are about, uh, you know, this latest and greatest product that, that, that they've developed. Right. No, it, it, you know, the reason I'm, I'm pressing on this because I find it so interesting. I mean, not a lot of people who I've spoken to on the podcast, you know, I, I would, would prefer to speak with management before they – screened out the the companies that they maybe want to speak with you know like especially at a conference you know like we you were at ours that when i when we put it on you know you put out the list first everyone kind of has their notes as the companies they want to see and then they'll go and meet management but you kind of have that that different way of looking at it i mean you know i i i almost imagine how you when you go and talk to management first you're kind of like all right tell me what you got and then you go back and you're kind of like verifying everything they're saying is true. I mean, is that kind of how you go about it? Yeah, that's uh, that's probably the, the first blush of it. I mean, uh, uh, and then you'll do more background checks either on channel partners. Uh, you know, if you've given if he's given you indication on you know who their biggest partners are on uh, on the development side or on the sales side. You know, all you need is one or two phone calls. Uh, uh, to sort of verify that that, that thread that you know there uh, you know one there's truth to it and two you know maybe the market opportunity is there and, and the channel side the partners are equally as excited as as the founders are mm-hmm. um, but you know you uh, it's it's usually a good check whether it's yeah you know, I, I love not because it's my background but you, know, you you get an engineer with an MBA and obviously it doesn't matter where the either degree comes from. Uh, I, I think that's the best mix uh, uh, as a starter and then hopefully you know that, that product's there that's addressing a, uh, an emerging market and you can see the growth you know you can see the growth prospects of, of getting this thing to 100 million in revenue and um, and then you just start getting excited about the story and you know and helping them get through building the you know the right infrastructure for the company, and then just growing the product and and, and watching it uh, evolve over time. So, so then, okay, when you're going back and now you're you're starting to verify. I mean, what are some of the the key indicators when you know you're looking at the balance sheet and the, and you're starting to do some of your quant measures? You know, what what are some of the things you're looking for? Uh, yeah, I mean, first we'll go. Uh, you know, as you're doing the the preliminary discussions, sort of what sort of yeah patent portfolio these guys have from an IP protection protection and you know how big is the moat that they've built around this opportunity then when you look at the balance sheet I mean uh, you know obviously hopefully uh, no debt to finance the to finance the early growth so they do have some runway to uh, to sort of build scale and cash flow and you don't have this sort of debt 
hanging over your head uh, if they do miss a quarter or two on the on the strategy side. Um, you know, uh, DSOs, accounts receivables. You know, hopefully they're not over a hundred or hundred and twenty. And why don't customers want to pay these guys? Uh, you know, maybe they're not happy with the product. Uh, maybe they don't have the systems in place to collect. You know, on a timely basis. Um, love to see a startup. You know, with 50, 60 day receivables, right? Because that means customers are happy, they're paying on time, and that's providing the cash flow for these guys to grow. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, you, you, so that's sort of one of the earliest flags you would look at is you, you find a DSO north of 100 days, you got to dig into that. Mm -hmm. Either you're selling to governments, you're selling overseas, or you have you know, unhappy customers that are taking very long to pay you, right? So, right. So, then I wanted to, to go back again to the to the your your process. You know, was there an experience that you had in your in your career as an analyst and investor that made you get to that comfort level of okay, I'd like to speak with management first and then you know follow up? Um, it, it really ties into. I think the balance sheet comment I just made earlier, uh, you know, 20 years in the business, I've lived through a lot of downturns, right? I mean, uh, uh, the, the, the Asian crisis in, in 97, the tech bubble, you know, March 2000, uh, the financial crisis of, of 08, that uh, you probably felt that one, I would say, or maybe, given your age, but, uh, you know, if you, don't have, if you don't have the balance sheet to sort of weather those storms, um, Especially at a startup phase, yeah, it uh, it makes it a lot tougher. Uh, um, uh, however, if you've lived through that, even as a startup, and you've lived through one of those downturns, and, and you, you know, you've managed the company, uh, uh, you know, by the bootstraps, so to speak, and you were able to come out of that a much stronger company and management team. Um, yeah, that was one of the things. Uh, Early on, because you know, I'd started in '96 in, at Scotia, and then in the summer of '97, you know, we got hit with the Asian crisis, and uh, a lot of my microcaps were struggling to get through that. And you know, some of them didn't didn't make it to the tech bubble. Um, uh, a, a few of them we were able to to sort of sell to to larger entities, but uh, and that's another good thing about the the Canadian tech market. You know, there's there's. A lot of large caps uh, that I do cover that are great acquisitors, um, and they've bought companies, not only Canadian companies, but U.S. and, and global companies. And you know, I've sort of grown with them, seen where they made mistakes on the integration side, um, and seen uh, you know how they've managed it to, to finance some of these larger acquisitions. But uh, yeah, I think it was early on in my career with the, with, with that sort of first Asian crisis in '97 in that um, yeah gave me sort of what to look for when a downturn does happen and are these guys prepared both from a management perspective and a balance sheet perspective to weather that storm. Right. Yeah, I was just going to ask. So you, you primarily only analyze Canadian companies, correct? Um, no, no, not necessarily. I mean, oh. uh, you know, over the years I've covered U.S. companies. Uh, obviously, all of my competitors for my companies are U.S. companies, so I, I've got to follow U.S. company. I mean, some of the companies we do cover. I mean, one of my top picks uh, is, is Pivot Technologies. I don't own the stock, but uh, it is one of our top picks as a firm. You know, they do a billion five U.S. in revenue, and it's basically a value-added reseller with ninety-five percent of its revenue out of the U.S. Right. Yeah. You know, head, headquartered up here from a you know the CFO and financial function, but it's it's. I mean, it's basically a, a U.S. entity. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so the other thing I learned, sorry, the other, just going back to your previous question, the other yeah. thing I learned when I was in Michigan and selling software, I mean, we were a private company, so it didn't matter as much, but you know, when you're selling technology, you do 70 or 80% of your business in the last month of a quarter. Mm. And most of that in the last two weeks of that month. Mm. So regardless of, of guidance that companies give you, it still comes down to the last two weeks of the quarter, and then this is for t selling tech. So, yeah, bringing a private company, 
I can go back to that auto manufacturer or that part supplier and say, look, I'm the only game in town. I've got the best software for designing noise and vibration. So I'm just going to wait till you pay my price. I don't need to give you a discount. But if, if you're public and you haven't made your quarter yet, you know, you're probably calling your CFO and saying, how much of a discount can I give on this software for us to make our quarter? Because you know what happens when tech companies miss their quarters, right? Right, of course. You know, you're down 15, 20% after market. And um, so, you know, I lived that for three years selling the software. So now, you know, I know what to look for intra quarter. You know, you can sort of track press releases. You can sort of get a feel from the companies as you talk to them the beginning of the quarter, midway through the quarter. Most of them won't talk to you at the end of a quarter yeah. <laughs> if they're public because uh, they want to avoid those discussions. But, right. you know, I lived that early on, and that's why I love recurring revenue models, right? I mean, uh, it's tough when you're a micro cap to have that recurring revenue stream where you don't have to worry about, you know, those last two weeks of a quarter. But... Um, you know, I have some of my large caps that are 90% plus recurring revenue, and those are the ones I don't lose sleep over. Yeah. The micro caps, you lose sleep over, especially the, the last two weeks of a quarter, right? So, right. so uh, just to follow up on that real quick, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, you have your, I think you said 18 names and then another 20 on a watch list. Yeah. Um, when they come out with these with these press releases, you know, what what are certain things that, you know, when they, when they come out and they, they're, you know, cause I know, I'm sure you don't call for every single one, but if, if they come out with one that's interesting to you, you know, what, what are certain things you look for in the different types of press releases these companies put out there that you're like, okay, I think I should, I need some more color on this one. Would it be like if they sign a new customer or, you know, they just file a new patent? Like what, I'm just guessing a few, but actually, no. Those are two. Those are two good ones. Um, and then, you know, maybe a new product direction. If if they announce, uh, um, you know, uh, you know, something on their product roadmap they hadn't discussed before. Uh, you know, if they're doing a pivot into another market, uh, uh, you definitely want to give more color there. On on the customer side, you know, maybe they didn't give dollar value or term of contract so you would try to get some color there you know is it a multi-year multi-million dollar contract if, if they didn't put that in the press release uh definitely want to get a feel for for the size of of contract mm -hmm. um you know new patents will give you an indication of what direction they're taking their products in right sometimes they won't release that um uh, but you know, if it's if it's just a generic, uh, uh, you know, uh, a small product sale or something like that, you, you normally don't worry about it. But if if it's a global, multinational customer, uh, they might not mention the customer. They might just say it's a global multinational in a certain sector, mm -hmm. uh, and maybe it's a sector they haven't gone into before. You know, first time they've mentioned they're in healthcare. That's definitely worth a call because. Um, you know, I don't know if you remember the the book. Uh, you probably don't, but the Gorilla Games, and yeah. you know, you want to you normally have that that lead customer in a vertical as your lead bowling pin, right? And if you can hit that one, then you know it'll That's knock right. down the right. So if it's the first time they mention a global multinational company in the healthcare space, it's like, oh, that's very interesting, right? And then you try to get some more color on that, right? Is there ever a time where one of your companies in the port that you're covering and or in your watch list when you're like, you know, I haven't seen a press release in a while. Um, maybe it's time to give them a call. <laughs> yeah, that's when you worry, especially in the two weeks left in the quarter and there hasn't been any news out. <laughs> um, definitely. So, you know, that fills your day when, uh, uh, you know, you sort of go through the list and it's, well, I haven't heard anything from these guys all quarter. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to follow now with a lot of the software tools that are out there. So you do a lot of headline surfing, you know, the headline comes out on a press release. Okay. That's, that's okay. That's not that relevant. Let's just let it go. But you know, if the headline, it catches your eye, uh, then, you know, you definitely dig into it a bit further if you can. Right. Is there, is there 
a type of software that, you know, you're, you're a professional analyst, you know, is there, is there software that you get to use that um, maybe an individual investor who's doing their own analysis that maybe they don't have the same access to, you know, what, what, tell me about your, your differences. In yeah. Experiences. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, we do get spoiled, um, you know, between Bloomberg facts at Capital IQ, uh, you can probably get any headline that's out there globally, uh, either across your companies or any of your the competitors of the companies you cover. You know, you follow Twitter feeds. You can use Google, you know, Google Alerts uh, uh, to sort of give you that headline. But if you really want to dig further into uh, either press release or companies that sort of generated that headline release, uh, you know, we definitely have access to. The stuff that would be expensive, I think, for the individual investor. But look, if uh, for the individual investor, just put in a Google alerts on you know the five or six companies that you're interested in, mm-hmm. yeah, that probably gets you seventy or eighty percent of the headlines that you're going to see in that name. Mm-hmm. Um, and then hopefully, you know, you would dig further, you know, either going to the company website to get more press releases or. Or going to some other sources that might not be as expensive as a Bloomberg or a Faxit or, or a Cap IQ. You know, just just to follow up on this real quick, you know, and this is kind of the the main crux of, of why I wanted to speak with you today because you're the first professional analyst we've had on the podcast. You know, you kind of already touched on this in your last answer, but overall, why, how would you say is being an a professional analyst different than uh, you know? me as an individual investor doing my own research on a company? Yeah, I think the access, uh, you mentioned this when we first started, I, mean, I think the access to management uh, is definitely easier. Um, you know, you will, normally you will get the call back or, or you'll get them live versus, you know, the individual retail investor trying to get a hold of a, of a CFO or a CEO, right? I mean, normally either the I, IR person or the IR firm that they're using will, will run cover for the management team. Uh, you know, the access and ability to go to conferences. I mean, uh, you know, my calendar starts every year with, you know, the, the Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas in January, right? Then February, normally you would go to the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. Come the spring, you would go to the CTIA show in Las Vegas. You sprinkle that with user conferences throughout the year. The showcase, um, the plan of yeah, my Yeah, definitely the plan of my <laughs> That's in my calendar now for you know, end of April, early May, whenever you guys are going to hold it next. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, it could get expensive for, for the individual investor to sort of go to all these conferences and that. Uh, you know, that's where I do a lot of my competitive checks. You know, at these conferences, right? I I know my I know my companies are going to be there, but I also know there there are ten competitors are going to be there, right? So, you know, just walking the floor or setting up meetings with you know the top two or three competitors of, of the companies I cover, you know, that's the best use of uh, of three or four day conference that you could find. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. I mean, do you do you feel that it's easier as an analyst to set up those types of meetings, you know, the, you know, they see echelon, they see, you know, tech, you know, managing director, tech analyst, um, to, to get those meetings when you're at the conference or, you know, when you're just doing your everyday thing versus, um, versus the individual. Absolutely. I mean, uh, yeah, normally before these conferences, I'll reach out to the companies I want to see and, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get my, 20 or 30 minute slot at their booth. Uh, you know, normally they have conference rooms at the back of their booths, right? And um, that is absolutely one of the best uses of your time. If you can, even if you can just choose one or two, you know, definitely start your year off with the Consumer Electronics Show. You know, you can pay the 50 or $100 just to go into the exhibit area, right? And uh, without getting a special company meetings. Uh, I think that's definitely worth uh an investment going to your microcap conference. I mean, that was a great use of my time. I got to see, you know, 20 or so names I you know, would have never seen before from from a U.S. perspective, right? So, um, uh, you, know, you just got to optimize, sort of look at your budget and which conferences you can go to, right? I mean, if you're in the gaming space, you definitely want to go to E3 
uh, and you sort of, sort of fill your calendar uh, on which conferences uh, you, you can attend throughout the year. So, Ralph, what would, would you say that the your criteria for when you're analyzing a company, would you say that's fundamentally different than those used by an individual investor? Um, I think from a, a screening perspective, you know, uh, we probably look at the same things initially. You know, what, what's their revenue? What it's, what's their revenue growing at? Are they profitable? Uh, yeah, what multiple are they trading at? Is it expensive? I think everybody sort of runs those screens uh, similarly. But then, you know, when you go under the cover, um, yeah, I think I would look at stuff differently than uh, you know than an individual investor would. And you know, hopefully, if uh, if they pick up one or two. Yeah, uh, different ideas. Uh, you know, from today's discussion, uh, that'll make their research even better. Right. So, so Ralph, this is one of my favorite questions to ask. You know, what what experience do you look back on as a defining moment in your investing career? Now, I know you mentioned the Netscape IPO and how that kind of got your got you to to basically make the move uh, to to Scotia. But, you know, maybe early on in your career, you know, what was an experience, you know, that you were like, wow, that was, that was interesting. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was definitely having, you know, being a tech company startup with debt. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I had uh, you know, 20 years covering, I think I've had maybe three bankruptcies in that whole time period. And, you know, these guys all got into trouble sort of layer, layering on debt to fund the growth. And then, you know, macro downturn happens and you're done, right? You can't service the debt and then either the bank takes it or, uh, you know, if it was convertible debt or whoever ended up owning that debt, you know, ends up taking your company. So, um, you know, that's why we'll always try to recommend it until you're, you know, at that mature stage and you got cash flow and EBITDA that you can service the debt, um, you know, try to avoid that at, at all costs if, if you can. And it was really an eye opener coming out of you know, both the startup side on, on the Belgian company that I was working with. I mean, um, to following public companies and, you know, making sure you don't get any surprises from, from that perspective. Right. So what would what would be your advice for new microcap investors? I would say again, make sure you feel comfortable with that management team first and foremost. Make sure they have skin in the game. I love to see management teams that own stock. Uh, you know, hopefully not sixty or seventy percent stock, because then you should sure. be a private company, right? But sure. <laughs> you know, if if they got diluted through an IPO or a financing, and they still have 10, 15, 20 percent in the game, then you know that you know their interests are aligned with yours. Uh, you know, for tech investing, I would say don't sweat the volatility. Yeah, they're gonna make their quarter in those last two weeks of any quarter, right? So. If they do miss a quarter, I mean, you got to ask yourself, did they miss it because these large deals were delayed? Um, and if so, you know, they close them in the subsequent month, you know, the following month, then I'd be buying that dip, you know, every day of the week, right? But if if they missed a quarter because the competitive environment has changed and maybe they lost one or two deals that normally they would have won, then that's the time to reevaluate your position and. Uh, you know, maybe sell the stock. But if it's just because something got delayed the last two weeks of the quarter, you know, a procurement guy at a large multinational was trying to play that discount game with them, right? And they dug in their heels because they're the best product in town and, uh, you know, they missed the quarter. Uh, If the stock sells off, you know, the next day after they report the quarter, I mean, I'd be buying it because nothing's really changed there and good for them that they dug in their heels, right? I mean, if... If competitively nothing's changed and they've got one of the best products out there, then that's when you want to, you know, add to your position if there's a 10 or 15 percent sell-off. So that's interesting. So you like to you really hone in on the sales cycle. I mean, that's that's from your Absolutely, experience. Yeah. But you you really hone in on that. Yeah, and you can tell right away. I mean, you can do your you can dig into it right away and see if they lost it, you know, because of a a competitive product, a startup that's out there that's got a better product and. 
you saw it with the flash storage guys, you know, eating the the hard disk drives lunch, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, as that transition happened three, four years ago, and um, you can see it in software uh, as guys move from enterprise licenses to the SaaS model, and um, you know, if it's just a function of of moving from a a million dollar license deal to a three year or five year sort of you know, SaaS model, that's fine. Uh, but if you've lost that contract because you know you got a, a competitor out there that not only has a SaaS model from a pricing perspective, but actually has better technology than the incumbent, mm-hmm. um, then that's definitely a, you know, a huge warning sign. And hopefully, you would have flagged that before the quarter came out. And right. Wait. So, so Ralph, like for those who don't know, how how do you um, look at like where do you go to find their the sales cycle? So. You know, do you go through the press releases? Is it in the balance sheet? Like, where where exactly are you able to, you know, chart that? Yeah, you know, it's 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 mainly through uh, calls with with the company. If you know, if you're not getting access um, as an individual investor, then I would read the transcripts from the calls because normally, you know, we're going to be asking those questions on the calls. Um, so that's normally a lot of my due diligence when I'm starting up with, with some of these uh, a public company that I haven't covered in the past. I mean, I'll go through the last you know eight transcripts um, and you know go through the the management intro, the, the ten or fifteen minutes uh, scripted part of their call, but then just go through the Q and A word by word, right, and and just see how they answer some of the analyst questions. Uh, and most of the time, you'll get some pretty good color there on whether sales cycles have changed. Uh, you know, have they gone from six to twelve months to, to twelve to eighteen, and you know, if so, why? And and you just keep sort of digging down, uh, right. you know, that that thread and discussion. Another thing I learned with with my microcap names is, uh, you know, to try to avoid the guys who are elephant hunters. You know, they go after these large contracts. Trying to get the WalMarts of this world, or you know, these large multinationals, and you spend 18 to 24 months, you know, trying to get that big contract, and by the time you get that contract, you've run out of balance sheet, right? And so, you know, I'd, I'd rather f- them focus on, you know, these these tactical deals where you can, you know, get the single and double and get some cash flow in and actually manage your business instead of going for the fences. You know, blowing through eighteen to twenty-four month sales cycles and you know running out of balance sheet, right? And, right. Uh, I've had a few of those early on in the career where you know they were trying to deal with a Vodafone or you know a large global multinational, and you know Vodafone would say, "Well, let's pilot it here in Poland, and let's pilot it here in, in the Czech Republic." And right. Yeah, you're not getting paid for those pilots. You're going through these cycles, and then all of a sudden, you know, you're in trouble, right, from a balance sheet perspective. Right. I was going to say, Ralph, even as a professional, where, where do you get the time to analyze <laughs> the last eight transcripts and also do everything else that you're doing? That sounds... Uh, yeah, I thank my mom for that. And, uh, I don't know. Uh, I get by still on about three hours sleep. Uh yeah, I have a long commute uh, to and from work, so I'll download the audio files. You know, it's it's always productive time when I'm driving. I'll listen to a, a conference call that I've downloaded from Faxit or whatever. So uh, I've got a pretty good associate uh, that, that that helps me out on, on some of these, and uh, um, so it does it does take some coordination and teamwork to to do that, but. I mean, look, yeah, if you can get an audio file, some companies will provide either the transcript or the uh, the audio file, right? And same with your bo- with your podcast, right? I mean, I'll download it and just listen to it on the drive home if uh, you know if there's a speaker or a topic that's that's of interest. So, uh, yeah, you gotta you gotta optimize your uh, your driving and commute times as much as you can, but. Uh, uh, we'll see how long I can keep going on three or four hours sleep. So, Ralph, where, where can our audience go and find more information about you and Echelon Wealth Partners? Um, yeah, you can go to, uh, I mean, our website is uh, echelon, uh, www.echelonpartners.com. 
Uh, you can go to LinkedIn and, and reach me through LinkedIn uh, if you wish, and uh, uh, hopefully go through uh, through Bobby, and we can continue the dialogue on, on microcap investing. Ralph, I, I thank you so much again for uh, for joining me today and also for coming to the conference and, and speaking on the Institutional Investor Panel. I, uh, I look forward to seeing you uh, hopefully well before uh, next April. Absolutely. And uh, hopefully we'll get some more companies down there for you from, uh, from our coverage universe. And uh, I look forward to, uh, to next year's conference. All right. Thank you, Ralph. I'll talk to you soon. Have a okay, happy, happy Canada Day. And happy uh, 4th of July to, uh, to you and your uh, American listeners. All right. Take care. Okay. Cheers. Thank you all for tuning in to the Planet Microcap podcast. And thank you, Ralph, again for coming on to the program. You can access the podcast by going on to stocknewsnow.com under podcast. Go to podbean.com and search Planet Microcap podcast or on iTunes and search Planet Microcap podcast. Stay tuned for the next Planet Microcap podcast where we'll have our next guest to discuss all things microcap. If you have any questions or comments about the podcast, please send an email to info at snnwire.com. I'd love to hear from all of you. This podcast has been brought to you by SNN Incorporated, publishers of stocknewsnow.com, the official microcap news source, and the microcap review magazine. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and thank you again for joining me on the Planet Microcap podcast. Have a happy July 4th, everyone. Happy Canada Day to all my friends and listeners in Canada. And as always, have a great week, everyone.